Hey guys, Spina Dude here, and today we're going to be taking a look at the 2013 Carnegie Collection Concavenator. All right, so before we start taking a closer look at this figure, I want to give a huge shout out to Killer Shrew Fan for hooking me up with this concavenator. This one's been on my list for a while, and as you know, the Carnegie Collection has been long retired, and it is extremely hard to get these figures, particularly the ones from the later years of the Carnegie Collection. And I saw Killer Shrew Fan was selling this one on a Facebook group I was in, and I jumped on it, and he gave it to me for a really good price. So I want to say thank you. Killer Shrew fan, I'll put a link to his YouTube channel down below and his Instagram so you can go check him out. He does some really good review videos and unboxings and everything, so make sure you go check out his channel. All right, Carnegie Concavenator time. So Concavenator has a few figurines of it out there, and this one is the best in my opinion. It has a very striking color scheme, first of all, which I really, really like. Just this tan color, dark brown striping, that distinct hump on its back, which is more like a sail on this depiction of the animal in that tribal patterning with the white bordered by the, the red. Just looks really good. And then the face has some fantastic coloration as well. I love the paler tan color with the white creamy markings going down the face. Really makes the head stand out. Yeah, the coloration here is great. And I think that's the most eye-catching part of the figure, if I'm being honest. Other than that, the sculpt is really good. I love the skin texturing. Throughout, There aren't really like individual scales throughout, but this figure was sculpted by Forrest Rogers and just her style of detailing Just makes it feel so naturalistic and it really looks like she based it off of a real animal just all of these Intricate little wrinkles and folds in the skin Particularly around the limbs and the tone musculature and everything just really makes this depiction of the animal come to life now the feet on this figure are not oversized, they actually might be a tad small in comparison to most theropods that I've seen, which is interesting. But because the feet are so small, in order to balance it on your shelf or wherever you're displaying it, it is compromised by a tripod stance. When the tail comes down like so and supports it on the ground. This piece though can be balanced on two legs. So what I'm actually going to do so I'm going to bring in my phone here for a second, and we're going to stand the concavenator on my phone. Try to get it to balance. There we go. See, look at that. It balances on its two legs without the need of a tail. On those tiny feet. This is more or less of a rare occurrence. On some surfaces and from some different angles, depending on where you're putting this, it will not balance, but just to know that this is an option, if you fiddle with it enough, I think it's really cool. And also the material this piece is made out of is quite bendy, so if you wanted to, you could probably warp the tail out into a straight position like so. It's interesting that this figure went for more of a sail-like structure rather than a hump-like structure on the back. Now I'm gonna be bluntly honest, I don't know what the current consensus is on this. I did some brief research and I couldn't really find anything, but the fossil material shows extended vertebrae right in front of the hips. And older depictions of concavenator, particularly around the time when this figure came out, used to have it as an attachment point or an anchor for a sail-like structure or a larger hump that just gradually descends in size going down the tail like this one, but more recent depictions mainly show it as just a hump in front of the hips with a divot behind the hips before transitioning into the tail. I personally think that for this figure, the sail-like structure looks really good. I actually did not like the way this figure looked when I first saw it years and years ago. I thought the sail-like structure looked very weird, but that's mainly because I didn't know what concavenator was until I saw this figure. And another thing that's interesting is a lot of older depictions of concavenator also had them with quills on their body, particularly on the forearms, because it is suggested, based on looking at the forearm material that we have of this theropod, that it had some quill-like barb structures hanging off of the forelimbs. But a lot of recent depictions I've seen have a great lack of quills, and it would probably be difficult to sculpt small quill-like structures at this scale anyway, so that's probably why there is a lack of them here. But the main thing that makes me prefer this concavenator over other concavenator figures on the market is the head sculpt. The head here just captures the Carcharodontosaurid look so extremely well 
with that gradual slope going all the way up from the front of the snout above the eye. It just looks distinct and recognizable as one of the shark tooth lizards. And that piercing glossy black eye against that creamy marking going down the snout is just really, really nice. There's a little bit of pink paint inside the nostril as well, which is great attention to detail. The teeth are very, very small, and there's just a line of paint across them, but for the size, it's really fair enough. The interior of the mouth has some nice detailing as well. It's done in a fleshy pink color. The tongue looks really nice, of course. But yeah, the head is definitely my favorite part of the overall piece. It just captures that, the look of Carcharodontosaurids extremely well. But yeah, guys, I feel like that really does it for my thoughts on this figure overall. It's not my favorite figure from the Carnegie Collection. It's really good, though. It is a solid figure of this obscure theropod, and it is the best concavenator figure out there, in my opinion, just for capturing the look of a Carcharodontosaurid overall. Of course, there's a handful of figures of this genus out there now, but I just think this one holds up the best when I look at the fossil material, particularly the reconstructions of the skull that I've seen. But anyway, in case you're wondering how large this figure is, it comes in at about eight and a half inches, which is about 21 centimeters. And in terms of the height at the highest point, which is the top of the head there, we are looking at about four inches, which is about 10 centimeters. And for a quick comparison, here it is next to the Carnegie Cryolophosaurus. Now, I actually did not realize until seeing both of these figures together how similar the overall posing and body style of these two are, sculpting-wise. These were both sculpted by Forrest Rogers. The overall postures are very, very similar. Similar tripod stance, and they just look like they're both mirrored with each other, even with the way the arms are posed. But I think they look great next to each other. Similar color schemes on the body, but the cryo has that hint of blue and the concavenator has that hint of red on its sail, of course, which really sets them apart and they contrast each other nicely and complement each other nicely as well. But anyway, guys, I think that's going to do it for this video on the Carnegie Collection concavenator. Massive shout out to Killer Shrew Fan once again for hooking me up with this figure. Can't thank you enough. One more Carnegie Collection figure knocked off my list. If you guys want to get this one for yourself, I recommend checking eBay or just joining some Dinosaur Collection Facebook groups and hoping someone lists one because that's how I got a few of my Carnegie figures. Anyway guys, I hope you have enjoyed this video. Leave a like if you liked and I'll see you all in my next one. So take care and bye bye. Okay.